Derek Shelton is a weakling puppet who succumbs to the whim of his excessively controlling general manager. Welcome to another episode of Mythbuster Week at Daily Shot of Pirates. Good morning to you. Good Tuesday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Pirates, and it comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or hockey. I also offer daily shots of Steelers and Penguins where you found this. One of the most common focal points for fan anger, especially over the course of a season that sees 100 or 101 or whatever it happens to be losses, is the manager. That's normal. That's also fair. Shelton has not been a great game manager, to put it mildly. And Shelton has not fully committed to winning the game in front of him. Shelton has also not put out lineups that necessarily make much sense, not just in terms of their order, but in terms of who gets utilized. Okay, so we've got that much in agreement, right? The problem is figuring out or understanding what the mechanism is behind that and why it happens. Because the Pirates aren't an ordinary franchise, as you know. The Pirates aren't in an ordinary phase of their franchise compared to where they claim they want to be. So that also has to be factored into it. And Shelton was brought in for the visible and acknowledged purpose of shepherding the franchise through to the phase where these things would become a little closer to the norm. So let's at least start out by giving him the benefit of the doubt there. Still with me? Okay, cool. Here's the part that I think rubs a lot of people the wrong way, including when I bring it up in an attempt to explain some of this. Not defend, but explain. And that's this. There are 30 teams in Major League Baseball. There are exactly 30 of them that do things pretty much the same way. The one or two places that have been outliers with this in recent years, even they have flipped now. And I'm citing, for example, when Tony La Russa was managing the White Sox until he finally burned out near the end of this past season. I'm talking about Joe Madden in Anaheim before that long, long, long losing streak that the Angels had did him in. I'm talking about just managers who are, let's be blunt here, really old. Even Buck Showalter now has to do things this way. The manager's role across the sport at the very top level has changed and it has changed forever. And for the people who only pay attention to baseball in Pittsburgh, and I'm raising my hand, believe me, I'm not one of those that spends a whole lot of time worrying about the other 29 teams, this can feel jarring because we don't compare Shelton to uh, whoever is managing this team or that team somewhere else. We compare Shelton to previous Pittsburgh managers. It's what we do. This is how Jim Leland would have done it. This is how Danny Murtaugh would have done it. Ah, you could go all the way back forever. But this is now universal. The GM and the entirety of baseball ops are very much in tune with running the team day to day. This portion of Daily Shot of Pirates is brought to you by our friends at North Shore Tavern that's directly across Federal Street from PNC Park. It's home of Steak on a Stone, an eating experience, underscoring the word experience. The steak is brought to you partially cooked on an 800-degree stone, and you do the rest. It's a ton of fun, it's a great meal, and it's a baseball atmosphere like no other in Pittsburgh. North Shore Tavern, right across Federal Street from PNC Park. So who does make the lineup? Since that's the one that seems to come up the most frequently, that's the one that I'll get specific with. Here's the answer to that, the actual answer. Shelton and Don Kelly will get together. They will work with information they've been given 
by baseball ops, usually in written form, though sometimes just by having everybody plop down on the couch that's inside Shelton's office at PNC Park. There will also be, either within that or in addition to that, Ben Charrington offering input as to, hey, we just acquired this player and we acquired him for this purpose and we feel he's this type of fit. Now, any of you who's ever worked at a job for a boss, and I'm guessing that's 100% of us, will know that when the boss makes a suggestion, you will be much better off if you listen to that suggestion. So when Shelton looks at us, dead in the eye, meaning reporters, and tells us the lineup, the final lineup is my decision, he means it. He's not lying. Except that there's more to it. Because the boss will have told him earlier in the day, hey, I just got this, this, uh, this amazing player. Can't believe he was available on waivers. <laughs> Let's call him, for example, Josh Van Meter. And we really like this bat. I'll tell you, so-and-so, uh, Billy Joe, Bob, whatever, scout out in the West, he's seen this kid and he just can't believe that he, we, we have to get him in the lineup. And we feel like he'd be a good fit at this position and that position. And that he profiles best if he's at, oh, you know, third or fourth in the order. And then the manager's sitting there with Don Kelly going, hey, Ben says the scouts really like this guy. Um, I don't know. I don't know, Shelty. Maybe we ought to we ought to play him. Yeah, maybe we should play him today. Yeah. How about if we play him at this position that they suggested? Yeah. And how about if we make him third or fourth in the order? That's how it goes. That's how it goes. That's how it's gone for a long time in Pittsburgh. You have to get really comfortable as a manager, to be able to reject these sorts of things. You have to be in a position where you're over the status of the GM in terms of who you are and what you're achieving. Clint Hurdle got there. Most people in Pittsburgh, and I can promise you this was true of Bob Nutting, saw Hurdle as just as big, if not a bigger reason, that the Pirates went to three consecutive playoffs. So Hurdle had reached the point, and I've told this story before, so I'm not going out of of line here by sharing it again. Hurdle had reached the point where one of these baseball ops uh, guys, I I call them the white collar brigade because they walk around with these white t-shirts with these collars and these uh, snazzy tan slacks, and they come into his room And they just silently leave this, I was going to call it a packet of information. It's more like a phone book. And it makes a thud when it falls onto his desk. And what is that? I asked Clint one day. He and I were the only people in the room. He said, that's the amount of data I'm supposed to process going into the game tonight. I go, really? Like, you're supposed to read all of that? I don't know. And he picks the thing up spins around in his chair and drops the thing into a wastebasket that he had behind his desk. And you want to talk about an even louder thud. This manager isn't anywhere near the stature of that manager. And most of them aren't. When we come back, J1Q. from John Gertowski, who asks, DK, if you can backtrack back to the first base situation that you were talking about last week, is there anyone from the young outfield core, current guys, Jack Sawinski, Cal Mitchell, etc., that you think could make a good conversion to that position? If you mean defensively, John, and I presume that you do, uh, in terms of whether or not they could handle it positionally, 
the answer is almost always a yes without being disrespectful to people who play first base at a high level because there are some always have been some artists at the position guys who just mastered it over there uh, it's not exactly the hardest one in the field so if you've got the athleticism and everything else to play somewhere else you can almost always convert to first base it'll take you a good spring training and maybe an off season but you can do it. And there's a reason that late in this past season, you saw the Pirates, or I saw the Pirates, working out Ben Gamble and Kevin Newman over at first. They're trying to make future decisions. They're trying to see what their options are as an organization because neither of them is technically signed toward next season, though Newman would just need an arbitration tender. If they can play first, well, that's something else that they can put on their resume. If they can even show it in some informal pregame sessions, it's also something to their credit. Now, <laughs> that said, none of these are really good options. Uh, Sawinski, right now, to me, would have to play himself out of the outfield. And he's not going to do that. He's young. He's got the athleticism to not only play a corner position, he also, as we've seen with our own eyes, can handle center field. He's not Willie Mays out there, but he can handle it. Cal Mitchell has also shown himself to be a pretty good, also athletic, corner outfielder. But the bigger issue with Mitchell and everyone else that you'd want to throw into that pile is what? Yeah, you got to hit. You got to hit. Jack can hit. We know that. We've seen it. Now, Jack can hit home runs. And to be even more specific, Jack can hit home runs at PNC Park. And Jack can hit home runs at PNC Park over the Clemente wall. But he hits a lot of them. And there's value in those. There's value in what he brings. Would you move him to first base at this point in his career? Plus, he's got to, by the way, Pretty decent arm. We've seen him throw some guys out. No, no, no chance. No chance. I don't see, and I've done this myself, John. I, I've tried to see if they can manufacture a first baseman from within. You can. Okay, it's possible. Even if you take someone that you feel has a, a pretty lively bat, potentially, and doesn't necessarily have a home in the field. I'm going to drop a name here. Diego Castillo, right? Where do you put Diego if he ever does get it together at the plate? Well, that might be a place. Diego isn't the biggest dude, but you know, you don't see exclusively six foot five first baseman around baseball. You just don't. It'd be nice. You know, you want them to be able to do all kinds of reaching and help you record difficult outs. But it's not mandatory. There are a couple possibilities in the minors. There's also the possibility, and I've brought this one up before, that if Andy Rodriguez ends up being your everyday catcher in Pittsburgh and Henry Davis hits his way onto the lineup, which you would certainly hope he will, being a number one overall pick in the draft, and you want to get him on the field a little more often and you want to allay some fears regarding his defense behind the plate, which really don't exist with Endy, maybe you try him out at first base. That's a thought. But in the interim, don't be letting them off the hook here, my man. Don't do it. They need to go out and get themselves a big-time first baseman. They really do. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everyone listening to Daily Shot of Pirates. We'll continue this myth-busting thing all week long. 